Thank you for being here today. So I'm going to start by um, sharing my screen. So I hope this works. Right. That, that's come through, Emily. Yeah, that's come through. Fantastic. Great. Thank you, Hugh. Okay, so this is um, a session on an introduction to close reading in French. Um, so what are we going to do today? Well, um, I want to talk to you about a text in French. Um, it would be great to hear your thoughts on uh, this text. So if you have ideas or comments that you'd like to contribute, please um, feel free to, to contribute in the chat. Um, I'll ask some questions at certain points. Please don't be shy. Yeah, there are no right or wrong answers here. None of this is a test. Nobody's being assessed. What we want is, uh, is for you to have a go. Um, feel free to, to, to venture ideas, suggestions, and we love, we love to hear from you. Um, okay, so what are we going to do today in this session on, on close reading in French? Well, we are going to uh, look at a poem in French. And one of the things I really want to do today is I want to persuade you that even if you don't have much training on poetry, even if you haven't read much poetry before, you, you probably have been exposed to a lot of poetic devices. And you have been, I would imagine, or adventure, um, because you've probably listened to a lot of songs. Yeah, we're all, we're all familiar with you know, pop songs on the radio, um, from the range of different kinds of songs you might encounter. Those songs contain a lot of devices that are very, very similar to a lot of the devices you'll find in poetry. So a song is a kind of patterned language that resembles the kind of patterning we get in poetry. And these are, there are, there are patterns in the, in the songs that you know that will serve you very well if you just have a little think about them when you come to look at poetry, yeah? So this is me trying to, to remind you that by osmosis, just by listening to songs on the radio, you probably know a lot more of poetry, about poetry than you might think, okay? And so this is gonna be my, my, my second slide here. It's using song to help us understand poetry. So I'd, I'd encourage you to think of your favorite song. Um, and if you think about what kind of language gets used in a song, and it can be a pop song, it can be a song you don't even like, that's always stuck in your head at the minute. But if you just think about some of the characteristics of that song, are there any features of it that bear some resemblance to a poem? Um, and I put that question out to you. Do you know, can anyone or would anyone like to respond in the chat? Is there anything, any features of the songs you listen to that you like that are also features of poems? Would anyone like to have a go at that on the chat, perhaps? Let's see, we have one new message. Oh, let's see. Okay, someone's written imagery, brilliant. Yep, definitely metaphors, similes, all kinds of images comparing one thing to another. We have rhyme, fantastic metaphorical language. Oh, they're coming too fast for me now. Repetition, brilliant. Repetition, repeated ideas, great. Yeah, so repetition is a really key one and that works really well. Someone else has written rhythm. So repetition and rhythm work really nicely together because often they're, they work on the sound of language. You know, they, they draw our attention to the, the, the rhythmic patterning of language um, and they work on us in a bodily and, a, and a, an acoustic way as well as in a linguistic way. Um, and then we've got another reference to symbolism coming up. These are all fantastic suggestions, yeah? We might point to other things. So in, alongside repetition, we maybe could point to something like, you know, we get a chorus and a song that comes back again and again. In some poetry, we often get a refrain and we'll be thinking about the importance of a refrain today. How does it work? What does it do to us as readers? Um, yeah, rhyme is another one that came up, I think, at one point. So these are all things we're going to think about. And I encourage you to just think about that poetry as patterned language, much in the same way as a song is patterned language, yeah? And something you're more familiar with than you probably think. Okay. Oh, I'll, um, 
I'll close the chat for a moment. Right, so we're going to have a think about um, a poem today. We're going to look at a poem today, which is closely related to song because it's a ballad. Yeah, you're all probably familiar with this word ballad. So we know that, you know, like lots of popular songwriters write ballads nowadays. So Adele is probably the classic famous contemporary ballad writer, right? So what is a ballad? Well, it's actually, the word comes from the medieval French and the term used to be a chanson balladé, which meant a danced song, yeah? And so these are still written now in poetry, yeah? So you can see this overlap traditionally between forms that were songs that then became forms of poems. Yep, so there's always this back and forth between song and, po and poetry. And so this is something you can really use to your advantage when thinking about poetry. And today we're going to look at a ballad that is called, so you can see the title on your screen. It's Ballade de celui qui chanta dans les supplices. Okay, so um, the most difficult word here is probably les supplices. Um, I, you may not have come across it. Does anyone know this word? Has anyone heard it? Maybe not, it's a bit of a difficult word. You can put it in the chat if you have. I can't see anyone typing, so I'm good. So the word means torture. Yeah, les supplices, it means torture. Would anyone like to have a go then at translating this title for me? Ballade de celui qui chanta dans les supplices. Can anyone think what this title might mean? No one seems to be sure, so I'll jump ahead. So it's it's the ballad, yeah, ballad of the one who sang under torture, yeah. So we can tell from this title immediately we're talking about a very particular kind of poem here, yeah. So this reference to torture gives us a little clue to the to, to the to the political context that we're going to be talking about. And let me just fill you in on some contextual details about this poem because the context is very important. So it's a poem that's written by Louis Aragon in 1943. Now some of you might hear that date and it, it will it will make you think, right? Because we know that the Second World War ran from 1939 to 1945 in France. So it's written, yeah, within this context during the Second World War. So the poem is a homage, yeah, a tribute, yeah, a commemoration of Gabriel Perry. Now, Perry was a very famous figure at the time. So he was a French communist journalist and politician. And crucially for what we look at today, he was a member of the French resistance. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about what the French resistance is and what its links to poetry are in just a moment. So Perry was executed by the German occupying forces on 15th of December, 1941. Now this is crucial because th this poem is going to be a commemoration of Perry's, um, of Perry's uh, role in the resistance really. So there's two pictures here um, on the right, the photograph on the right is a photograph of uh, Gabriel Perry, yeah, the person to whom this poem is dedicated. And on the left, we have a, um, a picture of the poet himself who wrote it, that's Louis Aragon. Okay, now to fill in some context um, about the circumstances in which this poem is written, I just want to talk very briefly about the French resistance and what it was, what it did because it will be important for understanding this poem. So if we go to the next slide. Um, so the French resistance and poetry. Yeah, You might think that um, political events of this magnitude might be quite distant from poetry, but I want to show you just how much poetry can be involved in and instrumental even within these important political events. So just to give you, to sketch the political context quickly, um, Germany invaded France in 1940, yeah, and then from 1940 to 1945, the northern half of France was ruled by the Vichy government. So this is something you may have heard about in novels or in films, yeah, so that we have the Vichy government and this government collaborates with Nazi Germany, yeah, for these years. Now, the French resistance emerges in response to this. What is the French resistance? These are small groups of men and, and women um, who work in small units or cells, and they try to disrupt 
sparked the Vichy government's collaboration with Nazi Germany. And what did they do? Well, they, they performed a whole range of activities. And again, you might, you might know this from popular culture, things like guerrilla warfare, um, passing information, maintaining escape networks. But today we're more interested in the cultural aspect of their struggle. And the, what the resistance did at this time was they published a lot of underground newspapers, which were really instrumental in shaping opinion. And they circulated texts that sought to persuade people to be sympathetic to the resistance and to resist and to work, uh, and to um, become more skeptical about the activities of the Vichy government. Now, I've given you a list of poets who all wrote for these underground newspapers. Um, Louis Aragon, Paul Eloi, and Robert Desnos are three important ones. Interestingly, they all go on to become surrealist poets, so poets who are very interested in the unconscious and very interested in experimental forms of imagery. So that's a very different kind of poetry that you might be interested in following up and looking at the difference between their resistant poetry and their, and their surrealist poetry. But we'll, that's, that's, that's the subject for another day. Today we're going to think about the poems they published in support of the French resistance. Okay, and we're going to talk about Louis Aragon in particular. So what, what, is a, what might a poem that supports the French resistance look like? Um, well, they wrote uh, poems that um, sought to discredit the Vichy government, poems encouraging people to support the resistance, poems asking people not to give, I think Desnos has a fa famous poem asking people not to give information. Um, and crucially, they wrote many poems that commemorated uh, the death of figures um, who, who died, who were executed by the German occupying forces um, when they were working for the French resistance. Yeah, so these poems of commemoration are really crucial. And that's, that's what we're gonna look at today. This ballade de celui qui chanta dans les supplices yeah, is, is, a, is a commemorative poem of that kind. Okay, so before we go on um, to look at this poem, I wanted to kind of put a question to you. And I wondered, given that I'm suggesting poems are a lot like songs, it's a kind of pattern language that you're really familiar with through your knowledge of song. I wondered, could you think perhaps um, why these poets might choose to write in poetry at this time? Is there anything do you think about the form of a poem that would make it appealing to poets who are writing illegally in underground newspapers and who are desperately trying to shape public opinion at this time. And this is just a quick brainstorm before we jump in to see the poem. But I wonder, does anyone have any ideas? Oh, very nice. Okay, so we have something in the chat, which is using imagery that can be sneaky. I really like this use of the word sneaky here. That's fantastic. So you're completely right. It's very, very um, common at this time. Playwrights, so lots of, um, lots of, so Sartre is one key one at the time. They wrote, they wrote plays which used symbolism, which um, had a covert meaning. So someone's written covert messages. Yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah. So those are that. Those are fantastic points. Okay, and we have some other points that are coming up here that are really good too. So someone said. So that the content of the poem would be memorable to the audience and resonate with the public. So that that idea also is, is spot on, right? Much like a pop song. These poems that have refrains, yeah, that have patterns, that have rhymes. Exactly. Someone else has written catchy like a pop song. That's precisely it, yeah? One of the reasons originally that poetry developed is that it, it helps us remember. Yeah, it's, it's a memory aid. Yeah, it helps us remember long passages of text. And so the, the patterned language we get in these kinds of poems, it's precisely catchy like a pop song that's, that sticks in your head. These, are, these were designed to be written so that people would remember them and that they would stay with them and they could be passed on. Someone has written shorter and more emotive than a novel. Really good, so exactly. I think that's the other key feature. And someone has written more relatable on an emotional level. 
I think those are two great final points. Yeah, these are wonderful suggestions, everyone. Thank you so much. You're 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 leading you you're leading this this um session for me. But basically, I think it's that the patterning of language. This is one of the strange things about poetry is that the patterning of the language makes it easier to remember. So it's accessible and it's easy to remember because you can say, oh, what's the next line? Oh, yeah, it's it's you you anticipate the next rhyme, you anticipate the rhythm, and that's easier. And at the same time, it's patterned in such a way that we get lots of um, expressive effects. Yeah, the sound acts on you in a certain way, the imagery acts on you a certain way. And so they're quite explosive in their content. Yeah. And so ironically, they're easy to remember, but they come with lots of compressed effects that act on us as readers. And this can be really useful within a political context for helping us to understand what a poem does. Okay, so let's move on then and look at this poem. Okay, so I'm going to read the poem in French and then I'm going to read the poem in English. And if there's any vocabulary you have difficulty with, I encourage you to, to look back and forth between the English and the French. And I'll read three stanzas and then three stanzas at a time. So you have, you have time to absorb it. So um, the poem begins, Et s'il était à refaire, je referais ce chemin. Une voix monte des fers et parle des lendemains. On dit que dans sa cellule, deux hommes à cette nuit-là, lui murmuraient, capitule de cette vie, et tu l'as. Tu peux vivre, tu peux vivre, tu peux vivre comme nous. Dis le mot qui te délivre, et tu peux vivre à genoux. OK, I'll just read the English quickly here. Um, let me just move some of the parts of my screen. I'm just blocking the English, so I'll just move them out of the way. Um, so the English reads, and if it were to be done again, I would take this road once more. The voice that rises from the iron chains, that's les fer in French, means iron, speaks for the days to come. Only a word and the door gives way. It opens up and you leave. Only a word and the executioner loses all his power. Yeah, in French, that's se disposer. He dispossesses himself. Hey presto, your troubles are over. Only a word, only a lie to transform your fate. Think, think, think of the sweetness of the coming mornings. Okay, and then our next, our next uh, page reads, Et si c'était à refaire, referait-il ce chemin? La voix qui monte des fers dit, je le ferai demain. So we, we appear to have, apologies, we appear to have um, skipped a page there. Let me see. Okay. Let me make sure. Apologies for that. Okay. Uh, okay. Sorry, this is the second slide. We, we accidentally skipped ahead there. So I'll read. This is the fourth stanza now. Apologies for that. We'll read that now. So the fourth stanza reads Et s'il était à refaire, je referais ce chemin. La voix qui montait faire parle pour les lendemains. Rien qu'un mot, la porte cède. S'ouvre et tu sors. Rien qu'un mot, Le bureau se dispossède. Ses âmes finit tes mots. Rien qu'un mot, rien qu'un mensonge pour transformer ton destin. Songe, 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 songe à la douceur des matins. And so in English this reads, And if it were to be done again, I would take this road once more. The voice that rises from the iron chain speaks for the days to come. Only a word and the door gives way. It opens up and you leave. Only a word. Um, and the executioner loses all his power. Um, sorry, have we once again, sorry, we appear to, my PowerPoint seems to be, no, 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 that's fine. Um, okay. I think what we're missing, Emily, is yeah. the translation of the first three stanzas into English. Okay. So okay. I think you read it in French and then yes. skipped onto the next slide. Oh, so apologies. Not... The first three stanzas. Okay, sorry, my PowerPoint has, has gotten mixed up. Okay. So I think um, you skipped skipped ahead without noticing, and I and I didn't spot it either. Sorry. <laughs> apologies, apologies. Okay, so let me take you through the first three stanzas very quickly. So the first three stanzas read, and if it was to be done again, I would um, go down this path again. The voice that rises from the irons speaks of tomorrow. They say that in his cell um, that night, 
two men whispered to him, surrender, are you tired of this life? You can live, you can live, you can live like us. Say the word that sets us free and you can live on your knees, yeah? And then, so our next page reads, and if it was to be done again, and if it was to be done again, I would take this path again. The voice that rises from the iron chains speaks for the days to come. Nothing but a word, only a word, and the, and the door um, gives way. It opens and you leave. Nothing but a word, only a word. The executioner loses his powers. Hey, presto, your troubles are finished. Nothing but a word, nothing but a word to transform your faith. Think, think, think of the sweetness of the coming mornings. Okay. And then it reads, um, Et si c'était à refaire, referait-il ce chemin? The voice, yeah, la voix qui montait faire dit, je le ferai demain. Je meurs et France demeure, mon amour et mon refus. Oh, mes amis, si je meurs, vous saurez pourquoi ce fut. Ils sont venus pour le prendre, ils parlent en allemand. L'introduit, veux-tu te rendre, il répète calmement. Okay, and so this, these three stanzas read, and if it was to be done again, would he, he go down the same path? The voice that right rises from the iron chain says, I will do it, I will do it tomorrow. I, fr I live, I, sorry, I die. And France remains, my love and my refusal. Oh, my friends, if I die, you will know why it was. They came to take him. They speak in German. One translates, do you want to give yourself up? He repeats calmly. And then our last, so yeah, I've, I've abridged this poem somewhat because it's very long. And the last, our last answer reads, Et si c'était à refaire, je referais ce chemin sous vos coups chargés de fer que chante les lendemains. So if it was to be redone, I would take this path again. Yeah, beneath your blows, yeah, your, your beatings, yeah, um, weighed down by the irons and chains, may let the tomorrows sing, may tomorrow, may all the tomorrows sing, may all the days to come sing. Okay, so we have a, a sense of the meaning of this poem, and now I would like to talk to you about it and have some think about what the patterning of the language is doing to us as readers. Um, so I wonder, could we start, and if you could just put your ideas in the chat. Um, what do we think, we get a bit of direct speech in the first two lines. I wondered, what do you, who do you think is speaking in these first two lines? Does anyone have any ideas? So given that our title is The Ballad of the One Who Sang Under Torture. Very good, Perry, very good. So Perry, the prisoner, yep. Yeah. So the one who's been working for the French resistance, who's been held prisoner, fantastic. So he says, if it was to be done again, I would take this road once more. Yeah, he's in chains and he's thinking of the future. And then we get two men who are speaking to him. Who do we think these two men might be? Does anyone have any ideas? So given the questions that they ask, who might these two men be? Very good, the German police, German, fantastic. Yeah, so this is a scene of interrogation, okay? And so at this point, I'd encourage you when you look at a text like this to map it very simply in this way. Don't be afraid to start by stating the obvious. And I say, say things like, you know, we have direct speech. We have a dialogue, we have a conversation. And then you start to unravel, well, what, what's important about a poem being structured as a dialogue or a conversation? Why has our poet not chosen to write this simply in the first person, but to present two voices? And that helps you because you start to think, well, okay, what are these two voices like? And once we start to question what these two voices are like, we start to figure out something of how the poem is working. Um, can I ask what you think these, these voices are like? If we think about the two men that are whispering to him at night in his cell, these two interrogators, um, you know, capital surrender. Um, tu peux vivre, tu peux vivre, tu peux vivre comme nous. Dis le mot qui te délivre et tu peux vivre à genoux. Can anyone tell me 
what kind of language do we think is being used here? What does the patterning of the language here suggest about uh, the way these men are speaking to Perry in his cell? What kind of features can you see? Very good, okay, demonstrate the two sides. Yep, two possibilities, definitely. That's, that's a nice idea, very good. What do we think of the repetition here? Tu peux vivre, tu peux vivre, tu peux vivre comme nous. What does the rep, why do we think the captors and the, the, the two people who are interrogating Perry, why do we think we get, what's the effect of this repetition, do we think? Very good, so someone's written in the chat, they're trying to coax and tempt him with the repetition, very nice. Yeah, and the, yeah, it's like a chant, very good. So this is all very persuasive language, isn't it? We get an interesting effect, which is tu peux vivre comme nous, dis le mot qui te délivre et tu peux vivre à genoux. And I'd encourage you to look at features like this, because this is very helpful. We've got, you can live like us, tu peux vivre comme nous, but then we get tu peux vivre à genoux. So the nous and the genoux rhyme here. And we get a very interesting twist. You can live, you can live like us, you can be free. But the rhyme then suggests tu peux vivre à genoux, you can live on your knees. So we get this nice tempta this nice um, twist. Yeah, rhyme leads us to expect the same sound. And we're expecting the same, but what we actually get is this little twist that is a bit of a, uh, what would we say, uh, uh, a jab at, yeah, towards the German captors. Where, where they're, the, what they're offering is actually not the freedom that they seem to be living, but, but a kind of subjugation, yeah? That they're, they're actually, yeah, you can live, but you can live on your knees. Yeah, so that's, that's a very interesting rhyme there. Okay, if we move to the, back to the next slide. Um, okay, so I'm interested here. So we began the poem, I'll just flip back. We began the poem with, et si la terre est faire, je vais faire ce chemin. So this was the voice of Perry saying, if it was all to be done again, I would go down this path again. I wondered what you thought about the return of this refrain in the fourth stanza. If it was to be done again, I would, yeah. Given that he's just been speaking to his captors, he's been, yeah, and they're asking him questions. What do we think about the fact that our refrain comes back in response to these questions? Do we read the refrain here in the same way that we read it the first time? Or is it a little bit different the second time? Very good. So people have put in the chat, he's resilient. It's a message of defiance and endurance against the captors, he's fighting back. Fantastic. So interestingly here, we get the same words, but the context changes each time. And that's a really lovely thing to look at is that each time the refrain comes back because it comes back in a different context, it has a different resonance each time. And like you've suggested here, He's using this refrain to say no, to fight back. Very good. And, and, it, and there's a, I think the consistency with which it repeats itself gives a message of resilience and defiance. Okay, so the captors continue to, to persuade him. And I'd like us to think then just once more about, so what happens when the refrain comes back the next time? So the captors continue to persuade him to ask him questions. And what they're asking for is just a word, give us a word. Um, and what they seem to be asking for here, rien qu'un mot, rien qu'un mensonge. They're asking for information, it seems. Information about who he's been working with, who his collaborator, who his um, uh, fellow resistance members are. And in response to these questions, once again, um, in the seventh stanza, we get, et si c'était à refaire, referait-il ce chemin? La voix qui montait faire dit, je le ferai demain. Je meurs et France demeure, mon amour et mon refus. Oh, mes amis, si je meurs, vous saurez pourquoi ce fut. So, interestingly, the refrain comes back here, but in a slightly different way. So, if it was to be done again, would he take the same path? There seems to be the suggestion now that this is such a difficult path. You know, it's, it's questioning, is it possible that he would do this again? And then, interestingly, we get a slight... Um, variation on this refrain once again, which is la voix qui monte faire dit je le ferai demain. So this voice that rises up says I will do it tomorrow. Yeah, and I just wondered what you thought of this next stanza. Je meurs et France demeure, mon amour et mon refus. 
Oh, mes amis, si je meurs, vous saurez pourquoi ce fut. What do you think of this play of je meurs et France de meurs? Can anyone think why that is effective? So I die and France stays. Is there a patterning there in the language that is particularly interesting in how it sounds? Um, even though we've got these two oppositions, I die and France remains. Okay, someone's written meurs de meurs, exactly. The two words sound the same, but they're two oppositions. And this really represents the, the predicament in which Perry finds himself. Does he stay and live uh, um, and continue his life? Or does he die and leave everything he loves? Okay. And then our next stanza, we see these two guards coming and taking him away, asking him if he wants to surrender. And it seems to be his last chance, perhaps before execution, to give up. And he calmly repeats, and this is our last look at the refrain. Si c'était à refaire, je referais ce chemin. Sous vos coups chargés de fer que chantent les lendemains. So the same refrain comes back once again. But this, we, we realize, is perhaps his last chance, yeah, to, 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 to give in. And so we get, like you suggested the last time, the, this message of resilience. Um, and the, it's more emotionally loaded every time it comes back. Because now we know that by repeating this refrain, he's potentially going towards his death, okay? So I'd encourage you to think these are simple features, much like the chorus of a song, where the same feature comes back repeatedly, but we hear it differently each time. These are very simple patterns in some ways, but their emotional effects can be really, really strong. Okay, we'll have to um, end that analysis of the poem there, but I'd like to leave you with some questions before I finish. So um, one thing I'd like you to think about is how do you imagine this poem might have circulated at this time? So this is a time in which carrying newspapers um, published by the resistance is illegal, um, in which being caught with them might result in imprisonment, being sent to a camp or being executed. Um, why do you think poetry or these kinds of texts might have been useful? Um, can anyone have a go just to end to say, to know how do you think this poem might have circulated and why might the fact that it is a poem be useful at this time? Does anyone have any ideas about it's, the way it circulates and why that might be useful? Okay, so someone's written through word of mouth, poetry is easier to remember and recite by heart by just saying it to each other. Fantastic. So if you attended Philip's talk just there, he talked about poems that were committed to memory until it was safe it was safe to write them down. And this is one of the wonderful things about poetry is that it can be learned by heart. Um, yeah, so, and, and so it, it can be performed orally for small groups of people. Um, and so this is one of the interesting features about it. But then also because we do learn it by heart and we do commit it to memory, we carry it within us. And that seems to be the suggestion of the refrain here is that Paris has this one line that he repeats that is, that is dear to him and that keeps him strong in, in a difficult circumstance, that, that poetry is something we can commit to memory and that we can uh, relive much in the same way as you relive the lyrics from, from your favorite song and they come back to you at important moments. Okay, we will have to stop there. Um, I've just put some other poems that you might read if you're interested in this topic on my, on my PowerPoint. Um, and I'm very happy to take any questions if anyone has any questions.